Great. So I'd like to welcome you all today. Good morning. And it's with delight that I introduce um, Dr. Richard Isaacson, who's the founding director of the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic at Weill Cornell Memory Disorder Program, assistant dean of faculty development, and associate professor of neurology at Weill Cornell Medicine and New York Presbyterian. He completed his residency in neurology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, Harvard Medical School, and his medical internship at Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami. Dr. Isaacson now specializes in Alzheimer's disease risk reduction and treatment, mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease and preclinical Alzheimer's disease. His clinical research has shown that individualized clinical management of patients at risk for Alzheimer's dementia may be an important strategy for optimizing cognitive function and reducing dementia risk. He's published novel methods on using a precision medicine approach in real world clinical practice of AD risk reduction. He previously served as neurology residency and clerkship director and his career in education spans undergraduate, graduate and continuing medical education as well as patient, caregiver and community education and outreach. He led the development of Alzheimer's universe a vast online education research portal on AD with greater than 2 million unique visitors since 2018. With a robust clinical practice, focus on multi-domain lifestyle interventions and broad background in computer science, M health, biotechnology and web development, Dr. Isaacson is committed to using technology to optimize patient care, AD risk assessment and early intervention. The Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic also studies digital biomarkers using a wearable biosensor and aims to rigorously evaluate the effects of personalized, evidence-based multimodal interventions on cognition, serum radiologic biomarkers of AD, and calculated AD and cardiovascular risk. And he also plays in a band called the Regenerates. So it's a great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Richard Isaacson, who's gonna speak about individualized clinical management of patients at risk for Alzheimer's disease. Thank you so much. Great, Nancy, thanks Thanks so much for the invitation. Thanks everyone for uh, for joining. I have a nice, nice group online. Um, and uh, that is the first time I've ever been introduced with the regenerates in my bio. And the fact that this is gonna be online one day, I'm telling, I'm t we have like 101 followers on Facebook. Um, and I'm telling all of my my old bandmates that uh, that that we got we got we finally got a shout out. So that's that's pretty cool. Um, and I see um, some familiar faces online. Um, so hello, and I see some uh, people I haven't met yet. So new friends and old friends. And if that's the Rick Hodes that I think it is, uh, thanks so much for coming. We haven't spoken in a while, but uh, great great to have you on. If if that's you, if it's not, and you're, it's like your your twin brother or or same name. Well, I like you have a great name. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen, and I am going to. Um, Oh, let's see, find my slides. Um, this is kind of like a brain test. And the goal of today's presentation is to, you know, try to give you a broad brush overview of what the heck is this new field of preventative neurology. And in that field of preventative neurology, can we support brain health, maintain brain health, and most importantly, reduce risk for, or even possibly prevent Alzheimer's disease. And, um, you know, from a, from a, you know, a, a preventative health perspective, um, we haven't really thought of Alzheimer's disease and dementia as a disease that really has um, any degree of pre prevention possibilities. Um, my brother's a Parkinson's specialist. Um, he's, uh, you know, a little bit older than me, a fair amount older than me. And when he heard I was doing this, you know, Alzheimer's prevention clinic thing uh, back in 2013, he said, what, you can't prevent Alzheimer's. You can't do that. Well, he's a Parkinson's specialist. And now this summer, we're going to be hiring a, a movement disorder specialist to focus on risk reduction for Parkinson's and Parkinson's prevention and Lewy body prevention. So, you know, the field of neurodegenerative diseases, um, we really have to start thinking about prevention as early as possible. Um, and hopefully over the next, you know, 30, 40 minutes, I'll, I'll try to, <coughs> excuse me, give you um, some of the reasons why and, and try to explain that there really, it truly is evidence um, for this, um, you know, based on the 2020 Lancet Commission, um, they Lancet Commission put together a report um, based on modifiable risk factors, at least 40%, four out of 10 cases of dementia may be preventable if that person does everything right. And, and that's, that's our goal to educate patients, um, to try to follow patients longitudinally. And then most importantly, we need to evaluate what are, what are the, truly the outcomes? Because you have to promise not to overpromise. 
And I really believe that um, you can't just say, oh, we're going to prevent Alzheimer's. You're going to reverse Alzheimer's. Like, I, I don't I don't I don't I don't use those terms. I say we're going to do everything possible that we can. And then we're going to track your own self over time to give you that, um, you know, uh, some degree of evidence of, of that we're making progress or, or if we're not, we, we better recalibrate. So. With that as an aside, um, we'll talk about grant support and disclosures. I've um, been funded by a variety of uh, folks, um, American Cabinet Neurology, NIH, um, Women's Alzheimer's Movement, led by Maria Shriver, um, also the NIH Clinical Research Loan Repayment Program. I have a ton of student loans. I'm 20 years out of school now, but I'm still paying off my loans, so I'm appreciative to the NIH for, for taking the edge off, at least. Um, had a lot of philanthropy. Um, when, when I started uh, in this field in preventative neurology and preventative dementia, um, like there were no grants at all for this stuff. There are still minimal grants, um, but if it wasn't for philanthropy, uh, we just wouldn't be able to make um, much progress. Uh, when it comes to uh, other disclosures, I'm a trustee of the McKnight Brain Research Foundation that focuses on cognitive aging. Uh, but by far my disclosure or bias related to this presentation that um, has changed the way that I look at um, both medical practice as well as uh, neurology and dementia is my uncle Bob and my dad's first cousin, Charlotte. Um, so this is a picture of my family, um, uh, Flatbush, Brooklyn, May of 1946. It's my cousin Irwin's uh, bar mitzvah, in case anyone uh, was there or has relatives that were there. Who knows? Lots of lots of lots of Brooklyn natives, even on the West Coast, East Coast, we're, we're all we're all dispersed. Um, and basically, in this picture, four relatives um, ended up being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease um, in, in in future years. And that that number is really striking. Um, and what I think what we don't realize is that Alzheimer's disease begins in the brain over 20 years years before symptoms. So, you know, as an example, you see a lot of young, vibrant people in this picture, but there are people that had the first stages of Alzheimer's. And in this case, this is my Uncle Bob. Um, he's 31 years old, and he's still young enough and to have no symptoms, no pathology. He's age 31. But as the clock just ticked a little bit further, he had normal memory. But at the age of 45, the pathology has started in his brain. At age 45, he has Alzheimer's, stage one, preclinical, pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's. Then he started having those senior moments and they said, ah, you're fine, I'll see you back in a year, see you back in five years. No, that was mild cognitive impairment, the precursor stage to Alzheimer's disease dementia. That was MCI due to Alzheimer's. And now at age 72 is when he got this magical diagnosis of dementia due to Alzheimer's, but the disease started in his brain at the age of 45. So Alzheimer's disease, you know, is a multi-decade disease. And if we can recognize that, I believe we can do something about it and intervene. So just kind of taking these statistics home a little bit, if at the age of 85, 45% of people have Alzheimer's, and these statistics range quite a bit, that disease first started in their brains between the ages of 55 and 65. Wait a minute, that's Alzheimer's, dementia, that older person's disease? No, that's a disease of middle age. That's, that's not, that's not older persons. But let's even look at this a little bit differently. If at the age of 65, 10% of people have Alzheimer's, well, that means in those people, the disease first started between the ages of 35 and 45. And that's not older age, that's not even middle age, that's still kind of earlier age. So um, believe it or not, there are 46 million Americans today, right now, that have Alzheimer's beginning in their brain, the amyloid and whatever other pathology, but no symptoms. And that's something we we kind of don't, don't think about. So, so I really believe that, that the field of, again, preventative neurology, Alzheimer's risk reduction, Alzheimer's prevention care, uh, dementia prevention care, brain health, whatever, whatever word you want to use semantically, um, really needs to begin early. And when we started the program, we saw people 40 and above. And then I had a 32-year-old uh, son of a patient that wanted to come in. I said, okay, come on in. I had to change the, um, the IRB. And then I had a 29-year-old a, a woman who actually ended up having a pre in one gene who else is she going to see? There's no one else for her to see. So I changed the IRB again. And, and, and basically we're seeing people as, as young as 25 and, and above. And, and that's honestly um, not, not egregious when it comes to when the pathology begins. So I'm not going to go into too deep of a dive of, you know, all the evidence out there. Um, and, you know, for those people that are listening that just don't believe that Alzheimer's prevention is possible, I, I, I get it. I've, I, I was there too a decade ago. I was confused, and I, I in 2009, 2010, 2011 is when my, you know, definitely my metamorphosis happened. But um, if you haven't been aware of the studies, it's okay. It's not common too. But but there are randomized controlled trials, multiple trials now that are published in real journals and in real real things that show that you can 
change your lifestyle and do things to attack risk factors, whether it's blood pressure, nutrition, you know, these are randomized studies, you know, high quality evidence that show that you can delay cognitive decline um, and, and we can have improved outcomes. So the finger study, which you may have heard of, we'll talk about that in a bit, nutrition, exercise, cognitive engagement, and regular follow-up with a clinician. Uh, the Sprint Mind Study, this is something on the bottom of the slide that I wish more people knew about. Um, the Sprint Mind Study was a randomized study. Multi-years, you know, three and a half years, they stopped it early because it was the outcomes were so good. This was published in JAMA a couple of years ago. And they showed that if you, you know, use blood pressure therapies to get the blood pressure down, when one arm was 140s over 80s was the target, and the other 40s was 120s over 70s or below, just in three and a half years of treatment, just that difference in systolic and diastolic, you can delay or reduce the risk of mild cognitive impairment by 19%. That's, that's a lot. Um, that's just blood pressure control. So, so I really believe that when you do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and you take the, the totality of evidence from randomized studies, as well as, you know, epidemiological data, there are things that we can do. And um, we've really tried to study this, um, you know, rigorously in our program. So what, what the heck is our clinic? Our clinic is called an Alzheimer's prevention clinic. Yes, I believe that that's, that's okay terminology. Um, we've actually written papers, you know, should this be called the Alzheimer's risk reduction clinic or the prevention clinic? And we've done, you know, studies on this and, you know, analyses about what the public understands. And when the public hears prevention, they understand it. When the public hears risk reduction, there's a lot of confusion. Um, and I believe that, and, and, you know, various other bodies, um, you know, WHO, for example, um, believes that the term prevention should be used when anyone is attempting to lower a person's risk. So we are, we're, we're, we're Zen with, with the term Alzheimer's prevention clinic. And what we do is we apply evidence-based and safe approaches. This is not a one size fits all. Different people have different genes, different people have different medical problems. And, you know, right now there's, uh, you know, a lot of medicine is, is a lot of cookbook medicine and for better or for worse, it's important to have evidence-based guidelines and algorithms for sure. Um, but, but Alzheimer's is a very heterogeneous disease. You know, people with the APOE4 variant, they're different. People without it and they have a different gene, they're, they're different, men and women, different, like completely different, especially the perimenopause transition in women totally triggers. And we've published on this and others absolutely triggers it's one of the key risk factors for women um, for, for on the, on the, on the, you know, decline towards Alzheimer's. And when you have the APOE4 variant plus a woman, you know, that's, that's, that's worse than a man that has the APOE4 variant. Um, so these are, these are really complicated interreactions. Um, and um, we try to apply the best available evidence. It's not an algorithm. Um, Fred Plum, who I feel like was out by you guys um, decades ago, uh, Fred Plum and, and Posner, I, I may be misremembering, but um, they came to Cornell um, you know, a while back and um, Dr. Uh, Plum um, and I had a conversation um, about this specifically and he, he went like this, he said, medicine is not an algorithm. And then he you know, talked to me about this for 45 minutes and it was um, you know, something I remember very vividly in the year 2000 when I was still a med student. So that's, that's, the, way, um, that's the way we look at things. When it comes to risk factors, um, there are modifiable things and non-modifiable. Um, you can't change your age, you can't choose your parents, um, but you can, you know, change your exercise patterns. You can change what you eat, and this isn't just about, you know, go eat healthy or go eat, I don't know, less carbs or whatever, you know, whatever you may think. Um, there's single nutrients, multi-nutrients, and dietary patterns, and we'll try to talk about that. The Mediterranean-style diet has a ton of evidence, but then what about the B vitamins and the omega-3 fatty acids, and what is the applied science to nutrition? Precision nutrition is really where we need to go and where we're kind of, you know, uh, getting to now. Keeping the brain active, I joined a rock band, for better or for worse, 101 followers on Facebook. Hey, that's social activity. That's good, too. Um, sleep is so important. Stress reduction, um, staying engaged in life. These are all things that are really important. And at the bottom right, um, vascular risk factor modification. If, if someone does only want to come away with one thing from this entire talk, and yes, you've heard about lifestyle and modifiable risk and that we may be able to make an impact in certain people, um, vascular risk factor modification is, you know, again, aside from exercise and, and, and nutrition and things like that, you know, cholesterol control, diabetes management, blood pressure control, stopping smoking. If you want to slam the brakes on cognitive decline and, and Alzheimer's disease, vascular risk factor control is something that, that we all have the power to do. We should all know our numbers. You know, when a primary care doc, um, you know, and I talk, um, I'm, I'm looking for 120s over 70s or below, and ideally 
honestly below or, or, or that would be the max. And, and I, I talked to the primary care doctor and, 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 and we, you know, talk about the evidence and we come to a, a happy medium. And, and I feel like we all need to work together on this. Is this a primary care problem? Is this a neurology problem, a psychiatry problem, a cardiology problem? This is a public health problem where, where physicians of multi-specialties um, really need to work together. Um, on the bottom left here, I have a, a slide. This is actually um, a device that I uh, wear. I wear it all the time. I have another biosensor over here. I sometimes wear a ring. I have all sorts of things that, you know, I have a chest strap when I'm on the uh, my the Peloton and, and things like that. So I'm a, I'm a data junkie and um, we, we slap these on people. And I know at least in some degree of objective data, how many hours a person's sleeping, what their exercise levels are, what their average pulse and their max pulse is in each of the activities that they do. And we really refine or fine tune every recommendation. We track people and, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we use these informed data sets to, to make, um, you know, better, better recommendations. So, so what exactly is the type of research that we do? Um, it's real world clinical practice research called comparative effectiveness research. So we take the best greatest hits of randomized studies and, you know, the strongest epidemiological studies. And what we do is we compare existing interventions for risk reduction and we track it over time in IRB approved comparative effectiveness uh, research studies. And we try to figure out in, in which patients it's going to work better. Um, and that's really critical, which patients meaning with memory impairment or without memory impairment. So we divide our group into prevention and then early treatment. So mild cognitive impairment that have amyloid, that's early treatment. Uh, that's what we call it. Um, and then we have primary prevention and secondary prevention, meaning amyloid in the brain, no symptoms or no symptoms, no amyloid. We lump those together, primary and secondary prevention in different groups. So this is the type of research that we do. And we try to apply emerging principles of precision medicine. You know, can we apply pristinely fancy, you know, whole genome sequencing to every person? Well, no, we, we don't have the resources for that. Have we done whole genome sequencing on a dozen or so patients and have tried to figure things out? Absolutely. But we try to do this kind of like watered down, you know, realistic version of, you know, we use the medical history, lifestyle patterns. We examine people. We look at blood biomarkers like a few genetics, APOE. We look at it on everybody. Why? It's not for diagnosis. It's for risk stratification somewhat, but it's to personalize care. And I really believe that. Um, there was a recent paper in JAMA, a multiple choice question, CME sort of thing. And they said, oh, you have the APOE4 gene and mild memory problems. Don't do anything. See you back in a year. JAMA is still saying things like this. And those answers are wrong and that's the wrong way to do it and hopefully by the end of this and if you want to you know pull some of our papers you know we've talked about and we've published on using apoe in clinical practice to personalize care we then also look at cognitive assessments you know if a person has you know pristine cognitive function that's one set of risk if someone is borderline even though their iq is here well that mismatch the difference between normal and optimal and really sensitive computer-based testing is something that we really, you know, uh, find important. We also look at, you know, a whole host of blood risk factors from cholesterol, inflammation, metabolism, um, nutritional markers. We look at omega-3s in the blood. We look at particle size. We look at ApoB in cholesterol. We look at insulin resistance. We look at homocysteine, vitamin B12, vitamin D. The list goes on and on. And we do as best as we can in this year to try to personalize care. In coming years, we're gonna be able to do a much better job. So we take this paradigm we call the ABCs of Alzheimer's prevention management. Try to keep it simple, but has some complexity. The A is for anthropometrics, meaning body composition, how much body fat, percent body fat, where is the body fat? As the belly size gets larger, the memory center in the brain, the hippocampus gets smaller, um, especially in women. Women that have elevated visceral fat above a certain level have a 39% increased risk for dementia. Okay, that's a recent study that came out a few months ago. Um, there's multiple studies for the last 10 or 15 years to talk about belly fat and memory loss because metabolism and memory should be thought of in a synonymous way. It's not just about how much fat, it's about where the fat is and metabolically inactive fat around the visceral organs is gonna increase metabolic syndrome. People with diabetes have twice the risk of Alzheimer's. And guess what? If we can minimize the body fat, if we can you know, attack met metabolism, if we can maybe use an anti-diabetes drug at some point, there's 
Um, for example, the, this is a the semaglutide is now going to be studied this year in, in, a, in a, a, a treat early treatment study for Alzheimer's disease, GLP-1s, interesting data on metformin. Again, not saying to use these necessarily off-label, anything like that, but I'm just saying that you know, the diabetes phenomenon and Alzheimer's, there's a relationship because diabetes, fat insulin resistance, fast forwards, amyloid decline. So there has to be a relation. Muscle mass, really important too, especially but perhaps more so in men. And we need to kind of sort this out. When it comes to blood biomarkers, like I said, a uh, third of my time, I'm like a make-believe preventative cardiologist. I was trained 20 something years ago by Arthur Agatson, who invented one of the first preventative cardiologist. He like literally invented the Agatson calcium score the, to, to stratify people. If you have calcium in your arteries, that means your cholesterol really needs to be treated. It's the same thing with Alzheimer's disease. We can take these metrics and understand where to intervene. So we look at preventative cardiology labs. We look at a lot of you know primary care type things. We look at blood pressure. We look at inflammation. We look at, again, insulin resistance. Um, and these are things that are the B, the blood-based biomarkers. And then again, the C, cognition, which includes um, measures of memory. We use the NIH toolbox. We use uh, executive function measures, processing speed and attention, language, learning ability, and also really important, odor identification. If someone is missing several items on an odor identification um, test, the smell test, um, something's probably going on. It could be Alzheimer's, it could be early Parkinson's, it could be something else, head trauma, zinc deficiency, there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, but but it's again, it's a harbinger of, of something possibly to come. So what we, what we then do is we put together as best of a risk assessment as possible, and then we do the best we can with evidence-based interventions. Um, because that we, you know, we, we're doing this so you know, personalized in like this bespoke fashion, um, we have to track people every six months in order to understand whether the multimodal things that we're doing are working. We don't know if the one thing that we're doing is working because we're never doing just one thing. On average, our patients get 21 different evidence-based interventions. And that was based on our published study in Alzheimer's dementia uh, just over a year or so ago. And that was our 18 month study of following people in a clinical cohort from baseline to 18 months to try to figure out, does a personalized plan using these types of interventions and modulating all these um, you know, labs and, and cognitive function, whatever else, what is the effect on cognitive function at 18 months? What is the effect on calculated Alzheimer's and cardiovascular risk? And do the labs change over time? So that was our that was our study design. And how did we do that? Well, we did this through uh, multimodal interventions. So I'm going to keep it simple here. This is easy, right? If this, then this, if that, then that. It's like a computer program. Um, I was a computer science guy in high school. My best friend, Justin, was just texting with Justin, uh, sat on my laptop when I was a senior in high school. And there went my Westinghouse project. There went my computer science career. So I'm the schlub that had to go to med school. So I went to med school. But this is a computer program, basically. And one day when we have all the rules for figuring out in a personalized, you know, precision medicine based way, if a person has this gene, then they're at this higher risk, but this therapy can help with that gene's function. And then we can do this. And this person is that risk factor. And this is a schematic of an example of how we go about all these decisions. All of these decisions are published. We have a methods paper that was also published in Alzheimer's and Dementia, the Journal of the Alzheimer's Association back in 2018. So this is a reproducible method. It's a very long paper. Um, it's 11,000 words with the supplement, 3,500 words with the main paper. It's called The Clinical Practice of Risk Reduction for Alzheimer's Disease, a Precision Medicine Approach. So if you really wanna get deep and you know need some reading materials before going to sleep in bed, every single thing we talk about in this uh, talk today and every single thing that we do in our clinic as of that year, 2018, uh, is in that paper. So this is all a reproducible method that, that you know in the scientific approach we try to give. So the next five or 10 minutes, I'm gonna to try to give an overview of some of the things that we do. Um, I could talk literally, excuse me, for an hour just on the interventions, but again, that paper and other papers out there um, can help. And at the end, I'm gonna give you a link to a course, free course, free CME course online, where we try to, at least in a couple hours, an hour mainly, um, kind of give you a broad brush overview of what we do. And this is all for free online um, on, our, on an education website we built. So nutrition and Alzheimer's disease. Um, there's just a, never in a million years when I was in med school or neurology residency that I ever think I'd be, you know, touting nutrition for brain health. Like that never made sense to me. I was not like a nutrition fitness kind of guy. Didn't understand that stuff. Um, now the science of nutrition is something that I follow very closely. Um, you know, back in 2000, there were three articles with diet and nutrition in the title. Uh, when I started the clinic, it, you know, there were 44 articles, you know, now there are, you know, I think at the last 
you know, over 3000 articles, you know, in, in 10 years, like the, the, the amount of published information on nutrition and Alzheimer's has, in, has, has increased by multiple orders of magnitude. So I do think um, that nutrition is hard to study. I don't think that you can, you know, eat a magic blueberry and prevent or cure Alzheimer's disease. But what you can do is think about nutrition in the dietary pattern sense and a single or multi-nutrient sense. So the Mediterranean style diet is by far the most evidence when it comes to brain health. Um, you know, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but green leafy vegetables, you know, multiple servings of produce a day are, are good for you. Whole fruits are better than juice because of the sugar. Um, devil again is in the details. Fatty fish, lake trout, mackerel, herring, albacore tuna, sardines, wild salmon. Those things are like really important. I've, I have my, uh, my tuna sandwich for lunch. There we go right there. Of course it's on bread and bread. Yeah. I'm going to go running later. So I need some carbs. That's fine too. I'm actually, um, uh, you know, I eat fish at least twice a week and, and fatty fish have high omega-3 fatty acids. And in certain people with certain genes, people really need their omega-3 fatty acids um, high. And we'll talk about that soon too. Um, there's been studies on the ketogenic diet, caloric restriction, um, eating less is probably better for brain health over the long haul, the mind diet. And then when we talk about nutrition, we don't just talk about the dietary patterns. We have to think about things like omega-3 fatty acids given at either at like as an FDA approved drug for cholesterol management but it can also be given in, in, uh, in either, whether a supplement form or whatever else, there's no FDA approvals for Alzheimer's prevention for omega threes, but there is FDA approvals for omega threes for cardiovascular disease. So, you know, the, the devil is again, is in the details here, and this uh, will be sorted out even more soon. Uh, curcumin, turmeric, um, again, is this a perfect, is, am I telling people to go on these supplements? Well, no, not necessarily, but we talk about it. We talk about cooking with it. We talk about in certain people based on study by Gary Small, maybe a certain type actually delayed a little bit of the amyloid deposition in a multi, you know, in a, in a, in a pre versus post amyloid scan study. Um, these are the types of things that we need to sort out over the coming years. B-complex vitamins use a ton of in my practice, but only in people that have elevated homocysteine. Why? Because that's what the Vitacog study showed. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So for each of these elements, vitamin D and caffeine and flavanols and dietary antioxidants, there's this whole scientific literature, all of this, and we can't get into it all now, but it's something that I do think you should um, look into at least a little bit. So the Mediterranean style diet, I think we're kind of all aware of, um, you know, fat is, is, there's certain types of fat that are good for you. Olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, drink it. It's like miracle grow for the brain. Um, these are the types of, you know, uh, changes that, that people can make that I think will really have, um, you know, better brain outcomes, you know, a red meat in, in low amounts, moderation, um, you know, low fat yogurt and milk, in moderate amounts, grass fed yogurt, may be better, maybe higher in omega threes, need more studies on that, of course. And then alcohol, alcohol is really tricky. Um, you know, less is more, I think when it comes to alcohol, especially if you have one or more copies of the ApoE4 variant. So, uh, these are again, Precision nutrition is where we need to go in our field. Um, my close colleague, Dr. Robert Kikorian, did a study using a dietary ketosis, very small kind of pilot, pilot nature study, but he showed within just six weeks, significant memory improvements, improvements in insulin resistance, improvements in waist circumference. This is, um, you know, people with mild cognitive impairment. These are people with real issues. They just made a dietary change. Now it was a big dietary change. Ketogenic diet is not, not the simplest thing to do. Um, but in six weeks, they were able to show something. And, and the studies on this just keep on coming out. We just had a follow-up study in Parkinson's disease, another pilot study. Um, so when it comes to um, multimodal interventions, um, I really believe that, you know, the biological principle of synergy, one plus one equals three. Um, and whatever dietary type you choose and each study has looked at things differently. Um, I think you really, we really have to include exercise on a regular basis, um, regular follow-up by physicians and then staying cognitively engaged. And the finger study um, worked both in people, people, people with the ApoE4 variant and without it. Um, and that's, that's um, you know, very important. So I think there are certain interventions that work across everybody, more one size fits all. And then there's other interventions that, that probably don't work as well. Um, I could spend at least 20 minutes on fish oil and omega-3s. Um, I like the term omega-3 is much better. We have omega-3 fatty acids. We have omega-6 fatty acids. There's anti-inflammatory, pro-inflammatory. They need to be in a specific balance. This is really confusing. The evidence is murky. But what I can tell you is, um, based on the work of Hussein Yassin, 
um, and many others, um, omega-3 fatty acids, in my honest opinion, based on the evidence, have to play a role to some degree in risk reduction for Alzheimer's disease. The problem is in the initial studies, you know, in 2008, for example, um, well, the Quinn study failed. People with Alzheimer's that got omega-3 fatty acids didn't do better. Well, okay, did they have their baseline omega-3 fatty acids checked? No. So if your omega-3s are good, why are we gonna supplement? That doesn't make sense. Um, what about, let's see, what's the dose? Well, what dose do the people need? Well, we now know that people with the APOE4 variant need a minimum of 2000 milligrams of DHA, doxahexaenoic acid, specifically to get into the you know, brain. You know, they actually did spinal taps, a randomized study looking at the levels. You know, people with the APOE4 variant just don't absorb the DHA. So the take home point here is it's not just about the dose. It's not just about the timing. It's not just about, it's about all these things, it's about the person's genetics. It's about the whole picture. So I really believe that omega-3s, um, obviously we always start with fish, fatty fish a couple times a week, check the levels, levels aren't good, cholesterol is high. These are the types of people person has an APOE4 or two variants, that's the type of person that we, you know, really um, increase uh, the, the omega-3 intake as well as supplements um, or prescription uh, omega-3s when, when indicated. So let's talk about vitamin B and vitamin and the B vitamins. Um, again, not something I ever thought I'd be giving to patients 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, but the Vitacog studies um, really showed that B complex vitamins can help, can slow brain atrophy, can slow uh, memory decline, improve memory function, but only in people that had elevated homocysteine. And homocysteine is an amino acid in the blood that again can be used as a marker for precision medicine and risk reduction for cognitive decline. Um, again, same thing, this was studied uh, in, uh, in Alzheimer's, no effect. And this was actually, sorry, studied in 2008. The omega-3s study, I think was actually published in like 2011, the Quinn study, I apologize. Um, but long story short, when you use these therapies, when someone already has dementia and the horse is out of the barn, they've had the disease for 20 years or more once they have dementia. But if you use these therapies earlier, that's that window of opportunity for these things to work better. And um, during M the MCI phase, if you have elevated homocysteine, B-complex vitamins can be used to, I believe, really improve outcomes. The other thing here is, again, sorry to get confusing, but precision medicine, not the most simple thing. People also needed to have adequate levels of omega-3 fatty acids in the blood for the B-complex vitamins to work in the best way possible. So again, there's a multi-nutrient, uh, multi modal component. So we do use B-complex vitamins quite a bit in our program. About 60 something percent of our practice actually had elevated homocysteine. So about 60 something percent in our study um, actually were given B-complex vitamins. Um, wake up and smell the coffee. That means there's about uh, 10 minutes left of me uh, blabbing. So that's uh, not too bad. And then of course we'll open it up for questions. Um, but uh, wake up and smell the coffee means caffeinated coffee probably has some sort of protective effect. Um, is it the calf caffeine? Is it the coffee? Is it the substance X that uh, these folks in Tampa, uh, Cal and colleagues, um, have, uh, you know, did some research on? I'm not exactly sure, but whether it's Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, uh, caffeinated coffee, uh, especially earlier in the day, I believe has a, a degree of uh, protection. Um, and, um, you know, I have do as I say, not as I do. I have my caffeinated coffee in the morning. I don't drink coffee if I can after one o'clock in the afternoon because it can, you know, mess with sleep wake cycles. Half life of caffeine is, you know, solid five, six hours and varies depending on the person. Um, but drinking caffeinated coffee earlier in the day makes sense. And I think that the epi uh, epidemiology evidence suggests that, but do we have randomized perfect trials? Well, no, uh, that's, that's a limitation. When it comes to flavonoids, um, you know, regular intake of blueberries and strawberries, a half a cup, two to three times a week, nurse's health study. Again, this was not a randomized controlled trial. Um, this was strong epidemiological evidence, but they, people that had this amount of blueberries and strawberries in their diet had delays of cognitive decline for over two years. And some people say, oh, that's epi, that doesn't mean anything, it's epi, come on. Well, these studies have been followed up multiple times. So Robert Krikorian has done randomized studies using wild blueberries, using blueberry powder. He's now doing the strawberry randomized study. And there is a science to this, and you can actually prove, like he's done, that these 
materials, these, uh, these components, the chemical components in blueberries, for example, move the needle when it comes to a randomized study as well. So that's, you know, that, that evidence is good enough for me. When it comes to cocoa flavanols, there are cocoa flavanols that have been studied in multiple trials that not only improve, for example, memory and blood pressure control, but also insulin resistance. So every morning in my coffee, I put purified dark cocoa flavanols in, um, and the exact type was actually studied in multiple randomized trials, um, both in Italy, at Columbia, and the United States, redone the trial. So again, um, the evidence is, um, is strong enough for me to use in clinical practice and then for myself. So the goal here is to try to figure out um, over the coming years, what is a brain healthy diet, how it differs from a heart healthy diet, and how that differs from an overall healthy diet, because in different people, these answers are going to be quite different. And just, you know, in January of this year, the NIH um, really started the first ever precision nutrition um, uh, push. Uh, you know, there was a first ever precision nutrition conference I got to speak at. I was very humbled to be invited to that. And um, I do think that this is kind of where nutrition is going to go um, in the future. So let's transition. Exercise. Somebody wants to reduce their amyloid in their brain if they have it right now, today, exercise is the only thing that we can do because we currently don't have a disease modifying therapy. There's one that's being reviewed by the FDA and all that kind of stuff. And there's other anti-amyloid therapies out there, but in mice and most likely in humans, more exercise equals less brain amyloid equals lower risk. Exercise is probably the most evidence-based thing a person can do to reduce a person's risk of Alzheimer's, to delay cognitive decline, and the precision component of exercise where you do specific types of exercise based on your body composition. If you have high body fat, we want you to lose it. If you have low muscle mass, we want you to gain it. We're gonna give you targeted therapies. We're gonna talk about the difference between high intensity interval training and zone two training and strength and balance training. And we're gonna to put together a targeted plan for you. Uh, I've worked with Sarah McEwen and we've, you know, ages ago talked to Kirk Erickson. There are some giants in the field of exercise research that I've learned a ton from. And, you know, I, I, I can't say we have the perfect recipe, but I think the perfect recipe of exercise depends on the person tracking pulse, tracking exercise output, tracking strain, average pulse, max pulse. Um, these are things that I think are really important as we, um, as we move forward. Uh, music activities, um, you know, even intensive musical training later in life can improve brain function. Okay. Lifelong musical experience slows brain aging and memory loss. So like Nancy said, I joined a rock band where the regenerates, not the degenerates, the regenerates music for the right brain. And uh, that's my, uh, my crew back in Miami. Uh, and uh, we used to have some good times. So then COVID hit and now no one's doing anything. So what are you going to do? So when it comes to stress, talk about COVID and stress. Um, well, it's been stressful being home alone, being home sequestered, being away from family and friends, maybe getting COVID. It's been a bad, bad, tough year. Um, well, stress and repeated distress and worrying about that stress, neuroticism or rumination is the number one thing that's tied to amyloid and tau deposition. And this has been shown. All stress is probably bad leads to worse cognitive outcomes, smaller brain volumes, but neuroticism, rumination, is the, the worst of the worst when it comes to uh, stress. So these are things that have been teased out now. Uh, social interaction, staying engaged, hobbies, um, having a sense of purpose, you know, countries where they have the earliest retirement also have earlier onsets of cognitive decline, um, staying engaged in life um, and in, in social activity with friends and family is absolutely critical. So um, that's the best I can do in a you know, 30, 35 minute overview of, of what we do. Um, again, multiple articles have been published. Um, again, clinical practice of, alt of risk reduction for Alzheimer's, a precision medicine approach, which is also published in Alzheimer's and dementia. But um, what I would say is these are the results. This is the best that we can do in the absence of randomized studies because what we do again is comparative effectiveness research. We give people with different cognitive status, different interventions. We then compare the two, how they did. And instead of using a high dose or a low dose, we use high compliance versus low compliance and compare the two groups. And then instead of having a control group, because we're a clinic, like we take insurance, we see people and we, you know, bill for modifiable risk factors that we treat. We're a clinic, like, like every other clinic out there, preventative health, preventative neurology clinic. And what we do is instead of having a control group, because that's unethical, if people are coming to see a doctor, you know, using insurance, we use natural history controls, meaning we use the rush 
data set. We use the NAC, the National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center uh, data, 38,000 people in there. And we see how those people did compared to our group. And is it perfect? No, but it's as best as we can do with real world comparative effectiveness research. And um, this is uh, the, the results to that trial. So as, a, as a, again, a quick overview, uh, this is um, a study that we did, we published last year using these multimodal interventions. Again, each person uh, got on average 21 different interventions. They could have gotten 15, they could have gotten 25, depending on their individual risk factors. Patients, believe it or not, were age 25 to 86. Some of the peer reviewers said that's a weakness. Uh, others said it was a great strength. So again, depends on how you look at it. Um, we have very simple inclusion criteria, a family history of Alzheimer's and no or minimal cognitive complaints. In the prevention group, we included primary and secondary prevention. That's this uh, green and yellow boxes here, meaning they either had amyloid in their brain or not, but no matter what, these people had no symptoms. In the early treatment group, these people had symptoms, plus they had amyloid in the brain. And what I mean by that is um, if people had MCI and they didn't have amyloid in the brain, they were excluded from that arm of the study. So this is um, as, 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 as best as we could do, amyloid versus no amyloid. Um, and in this study, the prevention group, um, we lumped them together, whether they had amyloid or not, because again, in the real world, not everyone's gonna be getting amyloid. So we decided to lump them together, not just because the N would be larger, but also because if someone is practicing out there and if someone has no cognitive complaints, this is what the expected outcome could be at 18 months following this plan if you don't have, you know, biomarkers, which is, you know, obviously expensive and hard to get. So hopefully that makes sense, the prevention and early treatment groups. Uh, again, what we did is we provided individual recommendations. We rated people um, on compliance, two separate um, uh, clinicians rated on compliance and the person themselves, the patient themselves also rated themselves on compliance. Um, we compared to two matched historical controls. So again, a little complicated. Prevention, higher compliance was compared to prevention, lower compliance, which was compared to the two natural history controls. So each group was compared to the high dose, the low dose, and then the control group or the, you know, the, the, the placebo group in, in some way. And again, limitations to this, but it's the best that we can do. Primary outcome measure was um, change in baseline to 18 months on the uh, Alzheimer's prevention cognitive composite. This is a scale that was developed by the folks at uh, Banner uh, to basically um, you know, detect uh, preclinical uh, changes and early cognitive changes in people that did not have dementia. Um, and we also looked at our um, risk scales, so calculated Alzheimer's and cardiovascular risk, as well as a host of um, serum biomarkers related to Alzheimer's risk. And here was our um, kind of gestalt results. And in the green uh, dotted line on the bottom, uh, those were the people that had mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's, amyloid in the brain, that followed less than 60% of the recommendations, and that was the cutoff. If you see here, this um, blue dashed line here, the blue dashed line were people with MCI due to Alzheimer's that followed greater than 60% of the recommendations. And you can see people with MCI, um, responded and took, and there's a large, big, big error bars here. So th there was a large variability in their response, but it took them longer. So that the further along a person was in their pathological process in the Alzheimer's, you know, pathophysiology, it, it took them longer to respond. But by the time we got to 18 months, there was significant difference between uh, the two groups. When it comes to the prevention group, whether they followed greater than 60% of the recommendations or less than 60% of the recommendations. And honestly, that, that average was, you know, over 30% of recommendations were still followed in the lower prevention, lower, lower um, compliance group. But no matter what, where you were in the earlier stage, whether you had high or low compliance, there were significant improvements uh, from baseline to 18 months. Um, when it comes to uh, the risk scales, um, across all risk scales, all cardiovascular disease risk scales, and the two uh, Alzheimer's disease risk scales we used, there was also uh, significant um, improvements. Um, and I can go into a lot more detail here. Um, and in the studies, there was also significant improvements when compared to um, age match controls. Um, but in general, um, and I say I definitely want to leave um, time for questions. We have about uh, 10 or 15 minutes left. Um, this was the first empirical trial in a clinical setting that showed that individualized Alzheimer's risk factor management um, may improve cognitive function related to Alzheimer's pathology because those um, cognitive tests um, really were um, basically meant to detect 
changes related to Alzheimer's pathology and, and really done in studies to, um, to, to track that. And secondary analyses showed reductions in calculated Alzheimer's and cardiovascular disease risk. And that was, um, you know, another, um, you know, supportive evidence that the types of um, interventions that we do um, are working. Um, so from a practical clinical perspective, I really believe that multi-domain individualized care can be applied to millions and millions of patients that are at risk for Alzheimer's dementia. And I think the next logical step would be to study this type of intervention in a large multi-site international cohort. Uh, the problem with doing this is A, uh, COVID hit, so that derailed things, and B, the funding for this type of study is, you know, is not a seven figure study, but it's at least an eight figure study. And, you know, getting that type of funds is, um, is challenging uh, for this type of work. So uh, we, we still have our work cut out for us. Um, so I want to definitely leave a lot of time for questions and I'm happy to answer any questions, of course, but um, if people do want to, um, learn more. We've uh, tried to uh, educate the public as best as we can. We have an extraordinarily long waiting list. Um, uh, we just can't handle the amount of volume that, that, that people are interested to, to come to the clinic. And what we've tried to do is put um, education online that's free and available for all. This is actually an education research study. So we put a course online, people get randomized to different permutations, then we can study the effectiveness of the education. And we have online courses uh, for healthcare providers, a CME course. Uh, we have a prevention course. Uh, for the public. And then we have uh, courses for students, high school students, college students, medical students, and neurology trainees. Uh, Seth Rogan actually was our guest professor in the randomized study. It was me versus Seth and, and maybe Seth Rogan won. Um, he's kind of a local, he's from Vancouver. He's from, lives in California now. So he's a, he's a West, West Coast, North America kind of guy. Uh, and um, it was really great to work with him um, and really get the, get the word out that brain health is a topic that the younger folks um, really need to pay attention to. So with that, I definitely want to leave time for questions and um, thank you so much. Thank you for that fantastic talk. Um, you really are a pioneer in dare I say rock star in this film? <laughs> Finally got a rock. I didn't make it in my business, in my, uh, my, uh, my band life as a rock star. I actually got on, got on TV once or twice for, for silly Alzheimer stories, but um, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I'll take it. The comparative research, um, the comparative effectiveness research design is so difficult. And I really do think that we have to get into the space of thinking differently about uh -huh. preventive uh, medicine. So let me, and neurology. So let me ask you a couple questions. So here sure. in the chat, so Okay. When you find an elevated homocysteine and start, um, you know, mm. B complex vitamins, and despite good compliance when repeating the homocysteine, it's still high. Do you go on and look into methylated versions of folate or cyanocobalbumin? And for example, the MTHFR gene status as an alternate B group for, for an alternate B group vitamin? Yep. Great, uh, great, great, great question. Um, so um, I would say that the exact answer here to these questions are, are complicated. I'll tell you what I do based on my clinical experience and based on reading every possible study I can based on talking to David Smith, who's the PI of the Vitacog study in the UK, Oxford, amazing guy, changed, changed the way I think about a lot of things. So what I do is generally speaking, we recommend the usual B-complex vitamins as first line for a person with elevated homocysteine. Um, and what I mean by that is the cyanocobalamin, regular folic acid, and then uh, B6. B6 is probably the least important of the three. And we don't recommend too high a doses, you know, 20 milligrams to 50 milligrams is kind of like where we go. Um, so we also do look at MTHFR. If someone does have a double mutation in um, 677, uh, for example, or maybe even 1298, occasionally we may start the methylated ones first, but we, we, we generally speaking... I don't know. This is tricky because I don't know. A lot of people also just, I don't know, come in on the methylated ones because they read it on something or they heard it on a website or something like that. But um, yeah, we usually start with the regular ones. After six months, if the homocysteine is still high and the person has a double mutation or even a single mutation, we'll just put them on the methylated. And we have a, you know, I have nothing to disclose in terms of brands or supplements, or I take no funding from any. I wish I did. I could pay off my student loans. Um, but long story short, um, there are some brands that are really good when it comes to the methylated ones. There's even prescription ones that have been studied and, and, and are probably pretty good too, but more expensive. Um, so yeah, we do do a lot of this. Um, do I think it's necessary for people with a double mutation to, to, to need the methylated bees? I don't know the answer to that. Do I think they work better? I don't know the answer to that. I think there's a possibility that they could, but I just don't know. I don't have like an objective answer and we haven't really been able to tease that out in our data set because it's, you know, we have a lot of mishmash in terms of people and it's hard to tease out. 
but yeah, I recommend methylated bees at least, I want to say up to half of, of the people that are on B complex vitamins, because either they have a, you know, double mutation or their bees didn't come or their um, homocysteine didn't come down. You know, people, as we get older above the age of 50, our ability to absorb B vitamins in the gut is less. Um, so, you know, sometimes you need higher doses, you know, giving a shot of cyanocobalamin. Um, I, I don't, we don't do that in our clinic. Um, is that better? I mean, I, I have no idea what the answers are, but, but the answer is, is we personalize it as best as we can. And it's, it's that's a really, really great, uh, really valid question. Thank you. And another question around dark chocolate. So could you expand more on the dark chocolate that you add to your coffee? Sure. And again, nothing to disclose. And I wish Hershey's or Mars gave me free chocolate or whatever. I literally have been paying for this powder that I'm about to tout because of the evidence, not because of me. Uh, but um, I've literally been paying for it for a decade. I've been on this stuff for a decade. I'm still paying for it. It's expensive. Um, so the, the type that we use and recommend in our clinic is something called Cocovia, C-O-C-O-A-V-I-A. -A -A. Um, and it's made by Mars. Uh, that's the disclosure. Again, I have nothing, no, no financial anything. Um, but Mars makes it and they made the process. They created the scientific process to understand the flavanol amounts in dark cocoa flavanols. So um, that's why the applied science of nutrition really advanced in the cocoa flavanol world because of the work that they did. Um, they did randomized study in Italy. They did another one in, in Colombia in New York, um, looking at like hippocampal uh, activation or something like that. And um, I use Cocovia in my in my coffee. I use um, I, my goal is at least a packet a day. Um, they uh, you know the studies probably a packet ish packet and a half is probably sufficient. Um, some people take the capsules. Those haven't been specifically studied, um, probably work similarly, but I don't know. Um, but yeah, Coco V I put it in my coffee every morning and uh, mix it up and it's bitter. I put milk in my coffee. So I do break my fast there. The first, the, my, my, my overnight fast is broken with, with, with milk. That's what I do. Cause I can't tolerate the, the, the dark chocolate without the, um, without a little bit of something to break it up. But yeah, I, I really believe in cocoa flavanols. If someone has um, any degree of insulin resistance or any degree of suboptimal memory, or maybe just wants a little bit of, um, you know, extra boost. Why do I take it myself? I think it's good for cardiovascular disease. Also, um, you know, blood pressure control. Um, I like the taste of it. So that's easily a reason right there too. Great, thank you. And we have, so another question, do individuals who modify risk factors pharmacologically, for example, antidepressants for anxiety and rumination or sleep aids in middle-aged individuals have decreased risk such as taking statins for hyperlipidemia of developing Alzheimer's disease? This is a, a great question. And we literally just queried our entire electronic medical record over the last 10 years to, um, to try to answer this in like a big data way. And we also have multiple studies that I've really looked closely at. Um, so I can, I can quote a variety of different things. So let me start by saying that, um, um, again, nothing to disclose or all generic anyway, but um, escitalopram, uh, you know, old, old Lexapro, which is generic, um, escitalopram um, has an anti-amyloid effect um, in, in a study that came out in, in neurology around August, 2020. Um, it's been, it's going to be studied with behavioral concerns and people with Alzheimer's disease. Citalopram was studied, the CITAD trial published in JAMA. Um, there's something about escitalopram and citalopram that I've been using these for, you know, 10 to 15 years or more um, in people with Alzheimer's and they seem to work better for the behavioral stuff and, and just in general. There's, I think there's some sort of reason for that. And I think it's an anti-amyloid thing. So the first thing I would say is certain antidepressants um, may be better than others. Um, when we looked at our data in terms of electronic medical record stuff, um, people that were on um, Lexapro and Citalopram as opposed to other antidepressants did better, meaning had a slower rate of decline, which I think is fascinating. We haven't published this yet. And also people on statins, th those people that were on statins versus not also had a slower rate of decline. Um, so these are all, um, these are all very valid questions and you're just going to get a lot of, um, different answers because different statins work differently. For example, um, you know, uh, atorvastatin and Crestor work, uh, sorry, resuvastatin work differently than for example, simvastatin. the simvastatin, which was Zocor study in Alzheimer's prevention didn't help. So um, I guess what I would say is um, statins absolutely, in my opinion, most of the time, that's my qualifier, can delay uh, cognitive decline related to Alzheimer's or dementia, but not all statins and not in all people. And that's a precision medicine answer. And I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, I think people with two 
copies of the ApoE4 variant need to be watched more closely with statins, but um, that's a something I usually don't say when I'm being recorded because I don't really have great evidence to back that up, um, but it's something that I'm interested in. Um, when it comes to rumination um, and sleep aids, oh, sleep aids, um, benzodiazepines, uh, can absolutely fast forward cognitive decline. That was also in our study that we haven't published yet. Um, but uh, anxiety and rumination specifically, I don't have much information on, but just, you know, SSRIs uh, are, I would say are helpful. Um, okay, next question. Um, uh, the Dr. Rick Hodes, pleasure. Um, hopefully, hopefully we can catch up at some point. Um, so coffee, organic and caffeine, and then comment on fasting. Um, Great questions. Um, organic versus inorganic are, are complicated. Um, the way that I answer this is in the United States or Canada, DDT and its byproduct, therefore DDE has been outlawed since 1976 and 77. So even with legacy contamination, most of the DDT and DDE in the soil is, is probably gone by now. So do people need to have organic foods, produce or coffee when grown in the United States um, or Canada? Um, I don't know that it's that important, but people with the ApoE4 variant that have exposure to DDT have a, I think it was a fourfold increased risk of Alzheimer's um, in a study that came out of Emory and UT Southwestern. I'm, I'm paraphrasing that hopefully. So I, when, when people have the ApoE4 variant, what I'm trying to say is um, I recommend that they choose organic if produce or other things are grown outside of the United States or Canada, because you don't know if they're still using DDT, which can then lead to DDE, which interacts with the ApoE4 variant to increase Alzheimer's risk. Sorry, complicated precision medicine um, answer. When it comes to caffeine, I am pro caffeinated coffee. Um, I don't know if it's two to three cups, three to five cups. I have no idea. Um, and cups meaning 375 milliliters. So, you know, Starbucks is, you know, multiple cups. Um, I don't know, but my, my gut says both caffeinated co caffeine and coffee together. Caffeinated coffee is best. And there was a study by Cow, CAO and colleagues from the University of South Florida at Tampa that kind of pushed me even further down that path, but, but I'm not really sure. The other, other question is fasting. Um, so let me, let me give some definitions first. There's um, intermittent fasting, which is in my opinion, when you're doing like you know, 24 hours or more. And then the other term is time restricted eating. Um, I like the, the term time restricted eating because in most of my patients, uh, we recommend time restricted eating, um, you know, 16 hour fasts or 16 hours of food restriction, uh, several days a week, three, four, five days a week, um, not more than that. Um, but basically if you eat all of your calories within an eight hour time period and you basically fast overnight, you have, you can have water, tea, you know, just, you know, no carbohydrates. Um, I do believe that that um, can have a neuroprotective uh, benefits, uh, both with a longevity, you know, anti-aging potential, but also from a mitochondrial perspective and uh, probably helps in some degree with Alzheimer's, but it's going to be different in different people. MCTs, uh, you know, for example, ketone bodies, ketone bodies are naturally produced when someone is fasting for greater than 12 hours. And I do think that um, ketones are a cleaner burning fuel in the brain. I think there's probably a difference whether you have ApoE4 or not. And there's a lot of, you know, pharmacogenomic and nutrigenomic uh, stuff there. But yeah, we do recommend uh, not just fasting because maybe of the, you know, autophagy and mitochondrial and whatever else you want to say. But um, when you fast for 16 hours a day, you're going to also eat less total caloric intake most likely too. And you stop, you know, snacking at night. So um, uh, fasting has really had a, a positive effect on brain health from what I can tell in our, in our clinical work. Um, okay, a couple, couple uh, more questions. Uh, questions open-ended. Does Dr. Eisen have any experience with MND, dementia prevention, risk stratification? I've seen a few young patients with a family of dementia and ALS, grandpa with a foot drop. And is this, uh, is this limited to neuromuscular clinics or am I seeing these patients also? Um, so this question really actually ties into the following question, with, um, which is how much overlap is there with Parkinson's prevention and Alzheimer's prevention? Um, to my you know, uh, summary, um, these are neurodegenerative diseases or mitochondrial diseases, ALS, uh, Parkinson's disease, you know, motor neuron disease, they all are of a common play with mitochondria. So if there's anything we can do to support the mitochondria, ketosis therapy, for example, fasting, um, autophagy, whatever words we want to use, that's something that I think may have cross-cutting benefits when it comes to um, the, uh, 
preventing or reducing the risk of a neurogenic dementia or motor neuron disease. Parkinson's prevention and Alzheimer's have a lot of similarities, but you know, maybe caffeinated coffee works better in Parkinson's prevention. Exercise may work better. Certain drugs may work better. Um, you know, maybe urate and the milk thing. I'm not sure if we could buy that yet, but um, I would say there's a reasonable amount of overlap, but the metrics are different. You know, we can do a UPDRS, we could do walking time tests, we can do um, digital pen. There's other uh, measures that we could use to track Parkinson's versus Alzheimer's uh, risk reduction effects uh, based on the, the interventions that we suggest. Okay, I think time may be up. Um, those are perfect questions. Those are great questions. Thanks so much.